welcome to episode 25 of the Freo Big Footy podcast. This week we'll be reviewing the game against Gold Coast where Fremantle ran out comfortable 48 point winners after a tight, tight close first half and then we'll be pre- the grand, previewing the grand final rematch between Fremantle and Hawthorne though both teams will not be anywhere near the full strength they were in the grand final with suspensions and injuries taking their toll. This week Seppo won't be joining us, he's, he's out on a uh, work junket uh, but he will be back next week. But we do have a special guest all the way from Los Angeles and joining us. Uh, Gil, how are you, mate? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Gav. Thanks a lot for having me on. It's great to be on. And I should give a shout out to all the people in the Perth and Fremantle area all over WA who I met last year at the grand final in Melbourne who were just so incredibly kind and welcoming. And I hope all of you are doing well. Yep, yeah, great. And it's great to have you back on board. And hopefully we will uh, get to see you out again at the end of September this year as well. This on uh, last Saturday night in pretty sort of treacherous conditions and uh, certainly first bit of rain we've seen in, in Perth for a few months. Fremantle, 12 goals, 15-87, ran out winners over Gold Coast who kicked five goals, 9-39, after they kicked the first two goals of the game. Sandilands was obviously quite dominant with a 58 um, hit out performance and obviously 20 of those or 21 of those to advantage, depending on which stats you read, which is obviously a record for AFL as well. Uh, but interesting, we still lost the clearances in that. But obviously the advantages that we did get at times certainly helped us set up a couple of goals, particularly early in the third quarter, which helped break the game open. Obviously, Gil, you would have seen it yourself over there. What did you think of the game? Well, you know, I expected a win over Gold Coast, and uh, it, it was a little jarring to see them get ahead by two goals in the very beginning. And especially with all the, the hype about um, uh, their maturing players like... Um, uh, like Matera and uh, Jager Romera and David Swallow. Um, so it was really, it was exciting to watch them. And uh, I kind of liked, the, I admired the fact that they really took it to us and really challenged us very early. And um, although the thing that really wasn't mentioned as much as, as Big Sandy and all his hitouts and hitouts to advantage was the job again that Ryan Crowley did on Gary Ablett. Um, just really completely... Uh, uh, negated his presence, and especially how he was able to suck that free kick out of him at the very beginning and kick the first goal. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously it would have sort of stung, especially after last week when Ross Lyon was talking about the uh, tardy starts that we had, particularly against Collingwood, and that was going to be a focus this week. And sort of when Gold Coast got the jump and game, sort of got two goals clear, sort of obviously must have fallen on deaf ears a little there. But gradually as the game wore on, Fremantle sort of worked their way into it more and more. The, uh, yeah, it definitely did. Yeah, obviously the uh, key matchup everyone was looking at was obviously Ryan Crowley versus Gary Ablett, and you have to think overall for the day that um, probably Crowley uh, probably took the honours in that one. What did you think? Absolutely, he did. I mean, with uh, I kept on waiting for the moment that uh, that Gaz was going to snap a goal from from somewhere crazy on the boundary line. And I just, I just figured, you know, you have to allow for a couple of goals like that, but they never came. And um, I just thought also the back line just did, did a great job in really neutralizing the forwards. And, uh, uh, and I think the Gold Coast still, they showed their, their inexperience a lot of times turning the ball over and making some basic skill errors. I think a couple of times they just handed the goals to Duffield and to Stephen Hill. And so they st- Gold Coast are, are definitely going to improve this year, but they have a lot. They definitely have a lot of work to do. Yeah, absolutely. And realistically, you'd think that over time they're going to. You can see that they've got the makings of a good side there. But it's interesting that realistically, I think since two thousand and thirteen, there's only been really probably I think three games where Gary Ablett hasn't scored at all. So I think that in itself is a as a midfielder is a feather in Crowley's cap as well, particularly when he kicked the goal himself. The other sort of player I thought stood out a little bit on, or for me on the night was uh, Tendai Mazungu, who sort of seems to be going from strength to strength, strength to strength after a few people were sort of doubting whether he'd be able to hold his spot with the inclusions of Morabito and uh, Sylvia back coming as a free agent this year. I think he's one of our most underrated players, and, and I think if we point back to that Sydney game last year uh, when his spot was in doubt, I mean, he really has risen to the occasion ever since then, and, and who would have thought that he'd go on and go down in history as being our first ever goal kicker in a grand final? Um, he's been terrific, and uh, I mean, as far as his endurance goes, he's always had a big tank, and he's been really clever when he pushes forward and is around the goals. 
and just has done a really, really great job. And it's, it's great to see him come up the way, uh, the way he has. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, Freddie Mantle's more experienced midfielders gradually got on top, particularly the extra size they had with Barlow, Mundy, and Fife in there. And obviously, it'll be a bit of a test for our depth this week with Barlow, unfortunately, being out for six weeks with a league injury and Fife copying a suspension, which just about everyone across the country, and I haven't found anyone who's agreed with that decision at all, which is, uh, you know, even when you speak to some of the Eagles supporters and stuff like that, no one or even any of the ex-players, there's just no one who's found that the right decision, which is interesting. I think you have to expand that to around the world, because I thought it was a joke, too. Uh, I, I, I really could not believe it. I was shocked to um, go online and to see where he had been cited. Uh, and I was imagining for what, because it just seemed as if he and Richetelli both equally um, got the best of each other in that, in that little encounter. And, you know, Fife was not going for his head. He wasn't doing anything malicious. And when I think of something like that and what's punishable, I think back to last year when Patty Ryder for Essendon left his feet and, uh, and bumped Luke McFarland and collected him in the head, and McFarland was nowhere near the ball. And Patty Ryder got three weeks for that. And, you know, to, to equate or even approach um, the Nat Fife contact, which was, which was accidental, to put that in the same category, I think is ridiculous. And I think the worst thing about this is uh, the whole thing about his ineligibility now for the Brown Law. And if, if, uh, if what I know about uh, Fifey is true from what I've seen on TV and heard from him, that individual honors don't mean the world to him. It's more about the team. But I just think it's really harsh to disqualify uh, someone for that award just based on, on this. And Damian Barrett, I thought, had a really good column that addressed that on the AFL website. Yeah. Actually, I think that I'll give you one that's even worse than that. I, I don't know if you saw it last year, the game with Adelaide we're playing with, Sean McKernan came through with a, and actually elbowed, deliberately elbowed the uh, Eagles player right in the head. And he only got two weeks for that, you know, and by comparison. And the frustrating thing, I think, is you've got to, the problem is with, with these type of things is the AFL looks at, what the outcome is, not the action. And if you look at the action, there was a bump. Now, if we go a little bit further on, Brandon Matera's one, where Brandon Matera and Fife both clashed, and it was probably a high, harder contact than the uh, Fife one, but because there was no blood on it, it's just play on. And likewise, if Richard Telly didn't come off with the blood rule, or Fife for that matter, they probably wouldn't have even cited it. But because the outcome is a, um, you know, a blood rule, They've decided that it's a uh, two-week suspension, you know. And as you said, he didn't leave his feet. He did everything correct. And, uh, you know, it just, it just sort of uh, smacks of, you know, watering the game down even further, you know. And, and you can see why people get frustrated or getting a bit turned off by the uh, game itself when you're getting those sort of decisions made. I mean, you certainly want to protect the head of players, but that wasn't in the right spirit of the game, I didn't think, that suspension at all. No, I would totally agree with that. Yeah, all right. The other uh, sort of interesting uh, guy, obviously Michael Walters sort of had a uh, pretty productive line, night down in Ford in terms of getting scoring shots, but Walt didn't have his normal kicking boots on, kicking two goals, five. And a few of those were probably quite gettable by his standards, that's for sure. But once again, it was probably pleasing to see that once again this year we had a number of our midfielders and um, even defenders with Paul Duffield and... Uh, who was the other? And Michael Johnson kicking goals as well. So although our forwards are not necessarily kicking a lot of goals at the moment, with Maine probably a bit down on what he normally is, but we had Daniel Pierce kick a goal, um, Crowley kicked a goal, um, Subin had a couple of shots, but Sheridan kicked a goal. So we're starting to see our midfielders getting a lot more shots at goal, which we didn't see last year, I think. It's always good to have that spread. Always good to have that spread of goal kickers. And I think that with the forward line, I think the goals will come. Uh, also, I think we have to take into account the conditions. Anyone who's running around like that on, on really uh, wet conditions is going to have a problem with their footing and a problem with their with their kicking. And um, you know, for what Sun Sun did kick, that was an incredible mark that he took way back uh, deep in the in the pocket, and then to uh, that left foot banana that he did that uh, that split the post. That was that was pretty to watch. So it's one of those things I think where Sun Sun excels at things that are really challenging and it's the easy stuff that he might need a little bit more help with and you know you'd have to think that in better conditions that both he and Pav 
are going to put it together. Um, with Chris Mayne, not sure what's going on with his set shots in the first couple of weeks. Um, Mayne did say that he was addressing that by actually practicing set shots and training after he had done a lot of pressure acts and chased people around. So you got to hope that that's going to get better. And um, the one thing that I still am concerned about, though, and I'm sure a lot of our fans are concerned about, has to do with just another tall target. Because uh, as, as nice as it is to see Jack Haneth get uh, some game time, he hasn't really proven yet that he's that second reliable tall target that can take pressure off of Pav the way that uh, Zach Clark has been shaping up to be, the way that Aaron Sandlins can be, and hopefully when Scott Gumbledon comes back, the way he can be. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, in fairness, probably the conditions didn't suit Haneth a lot last week, and he did work hard to try and move up and down the ground. But as you said, like, I mean, he didn't sort of even really relieve Sandy in the ruck that much either, which probably which didn't allow him to go down forward. So I think if you're going to, if he's going to get a roll inside, he probably either has to make a little bit more advantage of forward or run around in the ruck a little bit more because I actually think he's better up around the ground than as a forward. Um, he shows glimpses at times that he can lead well, but I think he's more suited in the ruck because his general field kicking is actually quite good, but he just, does, as you said, just doesn't provide enough presence down there as in the back lot or for the opposition defenders. That's probably someone like Clark or hopefully Gumbleton will. Sure, and then if you even take a look at the mobility uh, between Haneth and, uh, and Clark, I mean, it's like night and day. Well, with Zach, there's still some work that he has to do on his game, but you can just see that there's enormous upside, and he just made such great strides last year. And um, I think that when he slots back, and hopefully that will be against Hawthorne, you know, no disrespect to, to Haneth, um, I think it can only make our side better. Yeah, and... I mean, that's the thing is, like, Zach's still very young in terms of the Ruckman. And, you know, you see guys like, I mean, he's only sort of a less than a year difference in that, Nui and Fulo, and even he's considered an advanced Ruckman. So a lot of people sort of tend to forget that. And you said he's only got to get better with uh, a little bit more strength, a bit more physical, and just learning to read the play a little bit better as a forward as well. So, as you said, I think the upside, um, Hanif, I think, is going to be handy as insurance. But I think, as you said, for us to take that next step, now, I think probably Clark does need to come in over Hannah, who's had a chance to cement his chance spot. And I know he's competed reasonably well, but Clark definitely does offer more and gives Sandilands a little the, the sort of drop in ruck performance is not as great when probably if Sandilands goes forward compared to when Clark goes into the ruck as opposed to Hannah as well. Sure enough, we can only keep uh, Zach away from music festivals. I think we'll be all right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the other interesting. Uh, as you said, the thing was obviously they decided to go with Sheridan on the uh, off the sub this week, right? As you said, normally they sort of rotate between the sort of between Sutcliffe, Sheridan, or Neil, and even sometimes Nick Subin. But um, Sheridan did a few good things in that last quarter, coming on, getting nine possessions, and uh, kicking a goal as well. So it was pleasing to see that um, even though he was playing the sub, normally when I've seen, noticed him play sub before, he sort of tends to struggle to have a bit of an impact in the game. It takes a while to get into it, where he was pretty. Uh, pretty influential when he came on in the uh, last quarter last week. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's interesting watching the last couple of years in terms of productivity from subs, and you have to think that uh, that Sutcliffe has probably been uh, the most influential when he comes on, and that it's helped him earn his way into a starter on the team. Um, and then uh, Lockie Neal as well. So it's always good to have the guys fighting for that spot to be the sub and to get into the best 22. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know, and it's been interesting the transformation of Sutcliffe because obviously he was primarily a midfielder, but the last since probably halfway through the last year, he's sort of become our sort of small lockdown defender down there, and obviously played quite a lot of material on Saturday night, and he's and I think he's doing a pretty good job down there, and it'll be interesting to see this week, depending on which way Lyon goes with the um, inclusions, which we'll talk about in a minute, whether they decide to move Sutcliffe back up the ground or whether they just keep him where he was and maybe moved the ball in the middle. So, But I think having Sutcliffe, who's got that extra string to his bow, is certainly handy for, for the side as well. It sure is. I mean, I'm sure he didn't expect that uh, come the end of last year he'd be playing on Cyril Rioli in the grand final in front of 100,000 people. No, absolutely. And, and, I mean, I think on the day he sort of certainly, I mean, he, you know, he didn't play too badly at all. I mean, he certainly wasn't our worst defender by any stretch of the imagination. So that no, was really pleasing to see. Obviously, any other points you want to bring up uh, on the Gold Coast game before we move on to the grand final preview? 
I think one of the things that, that was was really pleasing was that uh, was discipline because these guys were not looking ahead to playing Hawthorne. They didn't look past Gold Coast. They took them seriously. They had to take them seriously. Uh, where maybe a different club or a different Docker side in different years might have moved on and might have thought to to themselves, "Well, we've got a win here. Um, we don't really need to worry too much about this. We're really going to save our energy for Hawth- for Hawthorne." So it, it's great that uh, that Coach Lyon has him as disciplined as he has him. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, and you, you'll, I think some of those players will be a little bit better for the run too. Guys like Nick Subin probably just didn't look like. Um, you know, probably as good as he did last year. So he'll obviously be, you know, with pressure on for spots in the next four to five weeks with some of these guys coming in with obviously uh, Barlow out for an extended period and even five for two weeks. It's going to give one, some of these guys an opportunity to fight for that probably one or two spots that are available in the best 22. Absolutely. It's always good to, to see that. And I have to say, uh, watching from overseas and still being a stu- student of, of footy, I love every week about uh, this whole deal with plane watch, who's getting on the plane to go. And uh, because of the time difference, of course, when uh, when teams are announced, when teams are announced over here for me, it's about 1.30 in the morning. So it's kind of nice. It's kind of like, uh, like a Christmas morning effect, uh, opening a present and uh, getting some nice surprises and having all the suspense. And, uh, and, and you know, the club has got to love this too because when has there ever been this much hype and uh, this much excitement over a home and away match. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's, I mean, you probably may not have noticed it as much over there, but I think unfortunately due to the injuries and suspension, it doesn't seem to have as much build up as it probably would have considering that Fremantle will probably be without three of their key players and Hawthorne will probably be arguably without three or four of their key players as well. So it would have been nice to see them at both teams at full strength, but, you know, you've got to put out, you know, I mean, that's where you're going to test the depth of your side. and. Uh, I mean, we talk about quite regularly, on the, even on the boards, about the depth Fremantle has. So this is an opportunity for them to show that depth and uh, stake a claim there. One of the things I think has to be talked about, and I think that uh, maybe, maybe you might have a different perspective on this, having grown up with the game and seeing it since your childhood, that uh, is different for me, is that this is such a physically demanding sport, more so than any other that I can think of, that the whole term full strength is a really relative term. Because when is the side really ever at its, its full strength? And I think it's really important to think about the season as not being a sprint but being a marathon. And it's really toward what, uh, what what's called the pointy end of the season where you really want to be at full strength. So when these injuries hit, and this has happened the last couple of years, I'm always approaching it like a glass half full, that it's better for it to happen early in the season than later. And uh, people are talking now, and there's a lot of hand-wringing going on and a lot of uh, anxiety. But I look back at 2012 and look at how Nat, how Nat Fife was out for 10 weeks with a shoulder injury. Or you look at last year when Sandilands didn't even play half the season, Pav didn't play half the season, and you take away McFarlane, who was missing for a long period of time, and uh, we did fine. And um, so I really, really subscribe to Coach Lyon's philosophy that, that one player does not make or break a team, that it takes 22 players. And actually, uh, with, with, uh, with the 25 you take, that's how many it takes. And it's not just dependent on, on one or two guys. No, absolutely. And I think it'll be interesting this week because obviously, although – most, I think most Fremantle supporters have sort of come around on Zach Dawson. Um, there's always a few people out there who, you know, sort of still remember him more from his Hawthorne days where he was a rack, you know, sort of rocker kick six or seven on him. But he really is a key defender, a key position defender for us who's really important in terms of our structures and the way we set up. And it'll be interesting to see this week with Dawson not there because he hasn't missed too many games since he's come over, how the side operates in defence. And uh, probably I think a lot of people will be surprised at... Um, how important he is to our font in, in terms of our structure and our makeup down back. And I think another thing to, to feed off what you're saying, I think that people are really going to realize how much this team has missed Garrett Gibbonson because when Ibo comes back, he's going to provide another dimension. And um, it was sad to see him sort of forgotten toward the end of the year when he had his, his, uh, his Achilles problem. Um, but you, you really have to wonder if he would have uh, made somewhat of a difference in the grand final had he been available. And, um, and, and Dawson, yeah, Dawson has been extremely important. I still remember uh, the game that he played 
in the uh, eliminator or in the eliminator against Geelong in, in 2012, and uh, how how well he stood up there and how well he stood up the whole time. And um, normally, the person I would think of to come back and slot in for him would be Silvani. And I know that uh, Alex Silvani went through a fitness test today. But if he doesn't come up, then then maybe it's Ibbotson who goes and uh, and and plays against one of the Hawthorne Tolls. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let uh, we're moving on to that um, Hawthorne sort of. We're recording this on a Wednesday, so we don't know the ins and outs. So we're just having a bit of a sort of speculation between us about who will come in. Obviously, three outs for us at this stage are going to be Zach Dawson, Nat Fife, and Michael Barlow. But there's also a little bit of a doubt on Michael Johnson as well, who didn't train today. Um, but McFarlane, who was also mentioned as being sore, he actually did train. So hopefully McFarlane should be right to go, but it'll be interesting to see with Johnson whether they're just resting him a little bit more or um, whether he could also be in doubt for the game on the weekend. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to see about that. It's funny how the footy gods have uh, ways of evening up things because uh, earlier in the week when all the reports were coming out of Hawthorne about Sam Mitchell not being available and um, also Luke Hodge not being available or possibly not being available. I think the footy gods kind of threw us something uh, to make things even up in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it, it's certainly a much more even game now. And I think it would be interesting, as you said, Gil, if they decide to bring Ibbotson in to the sort of back line this week, whether um, he does go on Gunston, because I think he would have been a very good matchup for Gunston in the grand final. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how... Uh, Lion approaches that defence because obviously Ibbotson's got a lot of experience down back there and whether they move like McFarlane and Johnson onto the key backs in David Hale or key forwards in David Hale and Roughhead or whether they decide to uh, you know, bring Silvani in instead and play him down back as a, on a key defender and maybe give Ibbotson another week in the waffle. I think that's a great point, especially the one that you made about Ibbotson playing on um, on Jack Gunston, because if you look at last year, there are, I think there are a couple of things people forget about the grand final last year, which is for the last 10 minutes of the game in the fourth quarter, Hawthorne didn't score on us. And the other thing, if you look at uh, at their forward line, uh, Ruffy, I think, had uh, had one or two. Uh, Buddy had one, but it, it, of course, it was Gunston that really uh, that was really doing the most damage. And I don't think that that um, Dawson looked completely comfortable playing against him. Whereas I think Ibbotson was probably, as you said, better suited for that matchup. Whereas uh, whereas whereas Dawson, you might feel like uh, that he might be better suited to take on someone like a Roughhead or a David Hale. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that. Uh... It'll be interesting to see the way they go and also the way they decide to go in the midfield. Obviously, you'd have to think Lockie Neal would be one of the inclusions um, this week, considering he was on the edge last week. And probably some people would feel it was a bit unlucky not to keep his spot after the first game versus Collingwood. So you'd have to think Lockie Neal will be the one guy coming in. It'll just be interesting to see what they decide with the other one. I know there was some speculation or talk from Ross Lyon about Hayden Crozier coming in um, and maybe move... And then they may look to move the bore into the middle of the ground and he would be a natural replacement or whether they decide to go with Sylvia, who is sort of coming off a bit of a quad strain two weeks ago, or whether they even uh, really go for the temp fate and they look at Morabito in the middle. Well, what I read today was and, and saw in an interview with Ross Lyon last night is that Morabito is still eight to ten weeks away. So that, that rules that out. But here's something else I thought about, which is kind of a long shot odd way of thinking about it, kind of unorthodox. You know, Ross Lyon has talked or Coach Lyon has talked about moving Michael Walters to the middle. And I'm wondering if that might not be his thinking this time in moving Michael Walters to the middle and slotting Hayden Crozier in up forward. Um, although I although I prefer the idea that you suggest that uh, DeBoer go into the middle and you keep Michael Walters where he is. Um, because I, I just think with DeBoer and his tackling and that's that's probably the best part of his game, and he's not the most reliable kick, that he'd probably be better suited to be in the middle, and as you said, is a, is a natural fit for that. I think they'll also have to look at the conditions as well. Um, obviously, being at the MCG, I mean, we've had a bit of rain here, obviously, last week. It'll be interesting to see if there is any rain in Melbourne for the game. But the problem, obviously, the ball would be a natural matchup for someone like Grant Birchall, who would like loves to run off half-back and does create a lot of, run from defence for Hawthorne, so his role is pretty crucial where, as you said, looking at the other guys they've got in there possibly, 
Crozier is probably, it's probably not the strength of his game. He's more of a creator. And as you said, if they decide Walters to go in the midfield, Crozier would be a natural replacement up forward. But if they decide not to do that, you know, whether they decide to bring Sylvia in, I mean, Sylvia could then play that half forward role. And, you know, even if he doesn't kick a lot, but if he could lock down on Birchall. And, you know, as I saw on someone's Twitter feed this week, if you're looking at the glass really half full, in Sylvia's last game against Hawthorne, he had 37 touches and four goals. So, albeit four years ago or five years ago. So, but if you wanted to go in the real half glass half full, that could be an option as well. Yeah, that would be something. And, and the other thing is, too, the thing I admire about Coach Lyon in this situation is uh, that he's not playing favorites here and he's not playing politics. That, um, you know, generally a team signs a free agent for a number of years, pays him some really good money, as, as Fremantle have done with Sylvia. You'd expect uh, that he'd be in there some way and somehow. And he has to prove his fitness. He has to prove that he is, uh, is adept to, to our style of play. Um, although I'm sure I share a lot of the fan sentiments in really wanting to see Sylvia out there and see, you know showing his worth and seeing what he can do. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that'll be the uh, that'll be the interesting thing. And you know, I know that um, Weber talked about it on the website yesterday that um, Sylvia was available for selection this week. So it'll be interesting to see which way they go because obviously they do have a number of guys coming in, and also whether, as we talked about earlier, Gil, whether they decide to give Hannah the break and bring um, Zach Clark in who didn't play last week. So obviously he's had a bit of time on the track and whether they decide that this will be a good game for him to come in because, you know, going against McAvoy and Hale, it, it might be a um, might be a reasonable matchup for us to do that because obviously those, those guys aren't going to be running around the ground significantly. Like McAvoy loves playing a kick behind the plane. He is a good intercept mark, but he doesn't necessarily get a lot of the running through the middle, so it may, may suit Clark to do that early on and maybe push those guys around a little bit, around the ground. Definitely, and, and one of the things that I saw, I did see some vision of, um, of Clark uh, in full training today, as, as I saw with Sylvia. So, um, you know, again, go back to that airport, we'll watch to see who's on the flight. Um, but I think you have to bring Clark back in at this point. I think you really do, and I think he gives us the best chance to, to win. Um, and with Sylvia, you might really want to slot him in for his experience and to finally just uh, – and plus he's used to playing at the MCG, so that's something that uh, where he's on familiar turf. By the way, I should tell you, I'm looking at the forecast, the weather forecast uh, on weather.com uh, for Melbourne. You're going to have to help me a little bit with the metric conversion, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it looks to be um, – Let's see. My my way of doing this is double plus thirty with from uh, from from centigrade to Fahrenheit. So it's showing fifty four degrees Fahrenheit with uh, a ten percent chance of rain on Friday night and uh, a southerly wind, a uh, slight southerly wind. So let's see, fifty four degrees Fahrenheit. What would that be in centigrade? Fifty four degrees. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Because thirty two is zero, isn't it? So I think it'd be about twelve. Yeah, twelve. Twelve degrees centigrade. Yeah, twelve degrees, yes it is. So yeah, twelve is not too bad. Like I mean obviously it's not um super warm or anything, but I mean that's comfortable conditions for football anyway. So as long as there's not I mean and I mean rain probably wouldn't hurt us to a degree either because obviously Hawthorne like playing that skillful kicking game and we've just had a game in the wet as well. So I mean we've got that experience in the wet as well to a degree. So it may end up suiting us a little bit better on saying that we'll probably lose a couple of our key tall or key bigger inside mids with Barlow and uh, Fife not playing. So obviously a fair bit will fall on Monday to be able to help with those clearances and using his body in close. Sure. And, what you know, it's funny. One of the things that we're not talking about, about uh, exclusions from either side that's pretty key is uh, Brian Lake, that he's still on suspension. And, uh, you, you know, as obvious last year, he was he just killed us with all the intercept marks and really shutting down Pavlich and, and doing what he did. So I think, I think Hawthorne, I think that's a, that's a pretty big deal for them to be playing without him because they are now pretty undersized in their back line. Yeah, I think the in interesting ones will be like, I think they may run with um, Sutcliffe on Cyril Rioli again, no doubt. But the interesting one for me will be whether they decide to use, um, like, because obviously Luke Bruce is one of those players that in their forward line they manages to slip under the guard quite regularly. Um, and whether they will they decide to put Spur on him, because he would be obviously our best probably lockdown defender in that regard. 
I mean, Duffield's got the height, but I don't necessarily think it's his, you know, great thing. And Bruce does love ducking out of the back of packs and stuff like that. You really have to be on your game with him. He does love, uh, he's a little bit like um, side bottom at Collingwood, but a lot better in terms of that. He'll slip out the back of packs and just manage to convert when he gets the chances normally. Obviously, he didn't do that too much in round one, where I think I think Ibbotson may, the more I'm thinking about it, I think Ibbotson may come in this week because I think he'll be a better matchup for Gunston than maybe what Silvani is. I don't think Silvani will have the necessarily the speed to catch him or to stay on him. Um, and, you know, yeah, it'll be just interesting to say, see which way line goes with that. Sure, definitely. The other thing is, too, that we one name we haven't mentioned as a possible inclusion is Clancy Pierce. And uh, I saw him also um, envisioned from practice um, training full. So you have to wonder if and if and uh, and where Clancy Pierce would slot in, because um, he's he's a big part of the team too. Yeah, he is. And, uh, he didn't sort of play very well last week in the or in the game again in the Peel game versus East Perth. And I know some people look better when they go up a level, but I think he'd be probably second or third in line to be honest from what I've seen in terms of choices. But as you said, they may decide that Pierce in the matchup may be all right on some on the right sort of player, but. He doesn't seem to have a natural matchup down back either because Hawthorne have got those three blokes to around that 193 centimetre and then you've got the others in there and I just can't see see him uh, doing that. So it'll be interesting to see. The other interesting point will be if Mitchell and Hodge don't play, um, which there is obviously some doubt, who do you think Ryan Crowley will go to? You know, that's, that's exactly where I was going next. I really wondered about that because if, if both of them don't play, then, uh, then who who do you send Ryan Crowley to? Do you send do you send him to Rioli and let Sutcliffe uh, maybe uh, run with Luke Bruce? You know that, that's a possibility. And then the other thing, um, also from a tagging perspective, this is where Fremantle might be caught out because Stephen Hill has had the tag, um, and then you look at David Mundy and people talk about possibly tagging him, and you wonder if Fremantle is going to be a little bit more vulnerable to a tag missing Barlow and missing Fife, that you, suddenly you take those two out of the equation. And gen, and then so then you narrow that down and someone becomes taggable, for lack of a better word. Wonder wonder how that's going to play out. Well, that's it. I mean, for me, I think Crowley, the ideal matchup for Crowley would be Burgoyne. I think um, Sean Burgoyne has, you know, if you let him run free across that back and through the midfield, he can really carve you up and he uses the ball really well. So I think he would be a nat. And in terms of pace and size, I think he would be a really good matchup. I think if Cyril got off the chain a little bit, then you can certainly look at it like Lyon did last year when they moved um, Crowley off Stokes, I think it was, and moved him on to Stevie Johnson. But I, I think right. Burgoyne would probably be a good starting point for him. Um, all the other option is you move Mazungu on to Burgoyne and start him. But one of those two I think would definitely have to probably pick up uh, Burgoyne, also, how, do you, how do you account for Stephen's brother for Bradley Hill? Because when he gets off the chain, he can be pretty dangerous too. Well, the other option is um, I would probably look at maybe playing them both on each other. <laughs> that happened for a part of the grand final last year. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly look at running them either way, um, both of them either either side. And I think I think Stephen's taken a step further this year as well. He's certainly a lot more. Um, he's certainly a lot more uh, in and under the packs a bit more this year, and. Uh, and he's certainly using his physicality a little bit more than he probably has in the past. So I think it's, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see. And obviously for us as well, we've got um, our small forwards in Valentine and Walters are both a little bit iffy as well. With uh, Walters with his ankle, and then uh, Valentine last week as well with the um, heat clash, etc. So hopefully uh, we'll get at least some of our better team out there. So that's for sure. Why didn't the match review panel suspend the ground? For uh, for hitting Hayden Ballantyne in the head, and <laughs> the crowd made head contact with him. Yeah, well, nothing would surprise me these days. Maybe because he didn't bring the blood rule out either. <laughs> so, be uh, I don't know. It'll certainly be a um. Well, as you said, it wouldn't be. It won't be as good as it would have been if we had both teams at full strength. But I definitely think it'll be a um, cracking game um, for both for both clubs. And I, although I think um, I don't think either team's going to take a great deal from the result. Obviously, the fact they can go three and zero. Oh, is going to be um, important, but I don't think it's going to um, make or break any of the team season. I think some people uh, sort of tend to overreact a little bit when you have some of those, uh, you know, oh, yeah, as you said, we've got a few suspensions, we've got a few guys out with injury, but 
at the end of the day, as you said, we're, we've got to be about the whole 22 that runs out there. And, I, you know, I don't think our season's going to be shot because we're losing two or three players. Last year, if you said we had, um, no Mc, as you said, no McFarlane for ages, no Pav for ages, no Sandler's for ages, what our chances of making the grand final, you would have said pretty much zero So in the past. So you've got to look at that in a context as well. Absolutely. And then also last year, I forgot to mention, we lost Michael Walters for a few weeks. Um, we played shorthanded in, that, uh, in the draw against Sydney. Uh, Hayden Ballantyne got uh, a suspension, and Pav was suspended for three weeks in addition to the injury. And we still had the winningest season in club history. And I think one of the things that, that people have to look past is that is that not only is this just a round three match, but we also get these guys again in round 21 uh, at our home ground. Yeah. And you know, wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't any Frio fan love to be uh, in Subiaco on on that day? When, uh, when Hawthorne comes to town. And um, I, I really hope that as badly as some of the players would like to take a victory away from this, that in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't mean as much as what the media is making of it. It's, uh, it's a round three game. It's great that both sides from the grand final are playing in it. But, um, you know, this is, this is not round 23. It's not the grand final. It's not the preliminary final. Uh, it, it would be great for a psychic uh, standpoint to get a victory and from a position on the ladder but this the season is a marathon it's not a sprint and so if um i don't think fans should be devastated if Frio don't come away with this um with a win although i think the mindset has got it is, is changing a little bit um and i think that fans also need to realize something else that this year there's been only one other team in the competition that did better than Fremantle. so i would hope that the fans and the players would look at this not hoping to come away from the first five uh, games of the season uh, to win four or five, but expecting to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the guys who come in this week have, have got an opportunity. As Ross Lyon always says, the people who are the incumbents always do get, you know, it's up to someone else to knock them off. And I think that, uh, you know, for some of those guys, I think they're going to be playing for to play in the, that best 22, they're going to get an opportunity with those guys out for a little, you know, even if it's only for a couple of weeks, well, they will get a chance to cement their spot. So I think it's going to be, uh, as you said, I don't think anyone's going to be sort of certainly taking their foot off the pedal. But uh, the more I'm thinking about it, particularly with what we were discussing before, with the uh, lack of size in Hawthorne's back line, you know, with guys like Cheney and stuff like that down there, I think the more you think about it, I think they will bring Clark in this week. And, uh, you know, just... Just to stretch that defence a little bit more, obviously they'll probably try and play Josh Gibson or probably go on Pavlich, you would think. Um, and then they'll, you know, it would be interesting to see how they uh, how they work it because I think we could certainly stretch them a little bit down back, but likewise they'll probably say the same about us with our, with our side. So, Sure, definitely. And, um, you know, again, um, with, with the tall targets, you just hope that by the time that, uh, that we do get Hawthorne in round 21 and toward, uh, toward finals time, is that we're really going to have some really good tall uh, options to throw against opposition sides rather than leaving uh, most of the work to be done by Pavlich or depending on um, uh, on Sandy when he's, when he's moving up forward. And, um, again, you know, here's someone that we haven't mentioned is Scott Gumbledon, and you hope that he pulls up from all these uh, hamstring issues, and you hope he pulls up well. And, um, you know, it, it's it's interesting because getting these guys back in the middle of the season, because the way things are going, he might slide into the team around when uh, Mick Barlow might. And um, that's something else to think about, that when you get guys coming in fresh off of injuries in the middle of the season, that can be a blessing in disguise as well. It can be almost as if you, you went out and acquired uh, a star player that's coming into the team in the middle of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and that'll take a little bit of time, but obviously you know, it's disappointing that he didn't get that opportunity to, you know, after his strong pre-season, to be able to show his wares. But hopefully, as you said, he'll get back mid-season and uh, be able to do that. It was interesting last week looking at the game as well, the Hawthorne-Essendon game. Obviously, it was close, but the other part was, well, that Essendon had an extra nearly 100 possessions more than Hawthorne did. And so just in terms of the way they possessed the ball, a lot of the, um, realistically, only three Hawthorne players had over 20 possessions. So it was interesting that they sort of didn't tend to overuse the ball, compared, especially compared to what Essendon did with their sort of chipping style where they took an extra, what, nearly 50 marks compared to Hawthorne. So 
be interesting to see what Lyon makes of that and how if he adapts his game style at all to it or whether he just they just play what we play and then uh, see if it's good enough on the day. Well, I'd have to think there have to be some adjustments made because if you look at the game last year, uh, before the grand final one in Tasmania, uh, Hawthorne pretty much car free all up. And I thought last year in the grand final, I think one of the things that's going to be important for the Dockers to do is to figure out when other teams are playing Fremantle style footy, how do we counter that? Because Hawthorne are such good ball users. I've never seen a team so skillful with the ball and make great decisions with the ball. And they've also got, obviously, the preponderance of left footers. Does that mean that more effort is made to force them onto their right side? Um, and you know, how, do you, how do you go about doing that? And when Hawthorne does beat the press by chipping around and kicking into, um, into not, and, not, and avoiding contests and, and kicking that way, how do you counter that? And I think some those, some of those things are going to have to be looked at because you you made that great point about Essendon and them chipping the ball around but taking a lot more marks using a lot more possessions, and um, uh, you have to look at that as far as is how to counter Hawthorne's expertise. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, no, it'll certainly be a cracking game, and um, you know, and it's nice to be back on the Friday night stage as well. So you know, Fremantle in the first three rounds have certainly uh, been in the limelight. So up to us to go out and. Uh, provide ourselves so what do you think uh what's your tip for the game uh Gil? what do you think will happen you know here's what i think is well first of all i should say i'm really very excited that it will be shown live here in the states uh albeit on uh, uh fox soccer plus and i know i know a lot of people are cringing out there when they hear that uh, yes afl is on a soccer network but hey uh, you know I, I wouldn't care what channel it's on as long as we get it um and uh i think it's going to be i think it's going to be a tight game um, and interestingly enough, I think I can't really make a call on this yet because of the inclusions. I would hope that uh, that no matter what happens, that that it's a that it's an exciting game. Um, I would think that this one might be a little too close to call. Yeah, I think if um, I think if Fremantle went in with the same side they went against Gold Coast, I think we would have been favourites to win, um, provided that Hawthorne didn't have some of their players still out. But I think now with our outs. I certainly think it more than narrows, um, evens up the ledger and probably Hawthorne have probably got close to their better side in, particularly because I think Hodge and um, Mitchell will play. I don't think Hodge will play, but Mitchell definitely will, I think. So it'll be uh, interesting to see how Fremantle will adjust to it, and especially for the young blokes as well. Getting another opportunity on the MCG is always a bonus as well. So we, certainly if they get an opportunity to try and move the ball a little bit quicker through the midfield, which is what we've been trying to do, on that sort of ground on a Friday night, it'll be interesting to see how that works and uh, whether we sort of uh, notice any noticeable difference from what happened last year as well. Sure. And, you know, one thing that we also didn't talk about in terms of emergencies, you wonder if, uh, you know, Coach Lyon was talking up um, Josh Simpson this week and you wonder if, my, if he might be an emergency in this game. And you have to wonder, too, how well Colin Sylvia pulled up from training and it seems like uh, that even down to the emergencies that they might get a crack depending on how some of the guys pull up from training. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's, it's just, you know, it's funny all the sort of ducks and drakes that you heard. But the thing is, um, it feels like a lot later in the season, but the thing is with Ross Lyon, he rarely does. Um, what he normally says is going to happen happens. He rarely pulls any selection surprises. And if, the guy, if he says the guy's going to be out, the guy's out, you know. I can't think of too many times in the last two years where he sort of said, oh, this player's not playing or this player is playing and then it's vice versa or, you know, it comes in as a late inclusion or something. Normally if he rules him out pretty early, it generally stays that way. So it'll be interesting to see, as you said, which way they decide to go. And I think it will obviously come down to the matchups versus Hawthorne as well as rather than just sort of looking at our structures as well. And I think Matt DeBoer is going to be the interesting one to see what they do with him and how he yeah. replaces. Definitely, yeah. I mean, sometimes he's been maligned for his kicking and for not uh, doing a lot of things that show up in the stat sheet. But he did, you know, Coach Lyon did give him some props last week for making some very important tackles against Gold Coast, and I saw that. And um, you know, he that, so he really has had. He's, he does the one percenters. He oh. really does. Maybe they don't always show up, but but he's he's there. Oh, absolutely. If you wanted to ever watch make a video of someone who, you know showing young footballers doing the one percent is the stuff that doesn't get on the stat sheet. 
you would set, you could watch these games and you'd easily be able to fill a DVD for all because he certainly does that. And, I, and, that, and that's the reason why he keeps his spot on the side. I mean, he doesn't get a lot of possessions. I mean, he does. He can mark. He can kick a few goals, and his kicking certainly improved than what it was. But as you said, he's in the side for those one percenters and nullifying their running halfbacks. And obviously, Grant Birchall is um, one of those key players. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, Mitchell's been playing down there as well. So it'll be interesting to see which way they. And I mean, even Matt Suckling, um, even though he's coming back off a knee, he's certainly with his left foot has got the ability to open it up as well. So. All those key forwards down there, or even those smaller forwards, will definitely need to be on their defensive side of their game as well, for sure. Absolutely. You know, and the uh, one thing about Nat Fife that no one has talked about, a little silver lining here. Maybe with uh, his not playing the next couple of weeks, maybe it's a good time to get him to sit down and talk contract extension. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously that would be, uh, that would be good as well if they, could, uh, if they could lock that away. And obviously there was some talk this week regarding Monday as well being close to finalising his contract. So if they get that done, and Valentine's nearly done a, on a three-year deal as well, so they're just about all the players they want locked away. If they could get that done sort of by, before the end of the season um, or certainly before the mid-season break, it would certainly uh, get rid of any possible distractions, etc. And and, um, and certainly uh, all, all supporters would be happy, that's for sure. Absolutely. It's just, just funny how things, uh, how things work mysteriously during the season. And... Um, uh, it's just it's just interesting because I think about some things that happened last year, um, that that really devastating game losing to Essendon, uh, and the draw against Sydney. I think ultimately it made Frio a stronger team for having experienced those things. And I think that I'm a big believer in what Coach Lyons says about where there's crisis, there's opportunity, and this is a team that uh, that the fans love because they rise to challenges and overcome adversity and. Um, not to indulge in a bunch of cliches here, but uh, the last two years under under Coach Line, I've seen and you've seen and everyone has seen the Dockers really, really rise to the occasion when uh, when a tough challenge comes their way. Yeah, and the other interesting thing this week will be the what sort of crowd they get there for the rematch. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about AFL crowds and whether they're going to, uh, you know, they've been down a little bit. But it was interesting that Fremantle this year have increased from 300 and about 390 Victoria members to over a thousand, so obviously they've had a big increase in their uh, Victorian membership. So I'd be interested to see what sort of crowd they get for the uh, for the game on Friday night there at the MCG. It definitely will be, and I read with a lot of interest Rowan Connolly's story and um, uh, and John Ralph's stories about the the downturn in attendance. And I think the AFL has to look and and really decide. Uh, and although next year is going to be very complicated because of the of the uh, the cricket that's going to be going on, but um, about this whether split round is really working, whether Sunday night games really work, and I still contend um, that it, it wouldn't matter who the demons were playing. The fact that they're going so badly, uh, it doesn't shock me at all that they didn't draw very well against uh, against West Coast because then you're talking about a, a, an opposing side from the other side of the country. How many fans could there have been from the other side of the country to go and see that? And um, so it was a great and interesting point about um, an, an A-League game outdrawing an AFL game in Melbourne. But considering what was on the field and what was on offer, I think that has to be taken into consideration as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you said, obviously this, I mean, Hawthorne are going to be unveiling their premiership flag for their Melbourne supporters. So obviously you would have to think that most of the Hawthorne fans will come out for that. And it'll be interesting to see what how Ross Lyon, um, you know, does it with his, mentions it with his side as well, you know. Will it maybe spur them on a little bit and sort of um, give them that extra uh, incentive to carry on throughout the year and say, listen, guys, you know, this is what we missed out on last year. I know he talks about the past as the past, but, you know, sometimes you've got to learn from the past as well and make not make the same mistakes. So. Hopefully, it'll we'll, uh, be interesting to see. And I think it will certainly give, uh, I think, us as supporters a better idea about where Fremantle sits at the moment um, after the game on Friday night. Yeah, sure, I, I really think so too. And, and I also wonder the whole thing about uh, the unveiling of the, of the uh, Premiership banner. Um, although, from, from a marketing standpoint too, I'm not sure why the AFL and Hawthorne would schedule a first home game in Tasmania before before they're actually doing this. It would seem to me as if you if you win the premiership, wouldn't you want to show it off in front of as many people as you possibly could the first opportunity you had? 
Yeah, uh, it, it was definitely an interesting ploy they decided to do that. And obviously they're trying to push pretty hard, you know, with Hawthorne in Tasmania. So, But you're right, I thought they would have definitely done it in the MCG. And Hawthorne Fremantle would have definitely been a good way to start the season as well as a round one matchup. And, you know, I'm surprised that they didn't go that way. But, you know, as I said, round three comes. And as you said, it's just a chance for us to uh, show our wares. And although it's just another game at the end of the day and it's just four points, it certainly will... Um, you know, give us an opportunity to sort of uh, test ourselves against another side that's going to be in the top four, you'd have to think, come the end of the year. Sure, and, and not to take anything away, anything away from uh, from Frio, of course, but uh, if you really wanted to put some, some real spice in Hawthorne's uh, unveiling their premiership banner, they could have had an opening night game against Geelong and doing it at the MCG with Geelong in the house. That would have been interesting. Yeah, absolutely, with their, especially with their uh, heated rivalry that's been over the years, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, no, it'd certainly be that way. So, but for me, I think um, this week, as you said, it's going to be a pretty tough game to pick. I know it's very hard to pick without the ins and outs being there. But I think when you're in doubt, and especially if you're tipping a team, you generally have to go with a side that's got the home field home ground advantage, particularly a team that's in the top four. If we had our best side out there, I think Fremantle could have won by maybe two to three goals. But without uh, two of our bigger midfielders in there, I think Fremantle may struggle a little bit, particularly because our Forwards in Maine and Pavlich haven't had the best starts to the year in terms of their production. Production, I know last week wasn't a great indicator, but unless our midfielders, unless our forwards can kick some goals, I think we're going to struggle to beat the Hawks. But as you said, I think it could be a you know toss either way. So you know, but I think Hawthorne maybe within by about ten points is a possibility this week. And I think if Fremantle get within ten points, it's still a pretty good uh, pretty good indicator for the rest of the season for us. I think so too, and I really, really think that the more important matchup with Hawthorne is still going to be round 21 at Patterson's because what what a momentum lift that might be to you know to beat those guys on our home ground and take that going into what hopefully will be another really great finals campaign. Um, but somehow I think they have got to they've got to break the mystique that uh, that Hawthorne can't be beaten because these guys are human. And uh, we're, we're going to get them at some point. Absolutely. And, like, you know, although we haven't got a great record against them, I think we've only won 25% of our games. Most of those have been in um, – a lot of those have been in Melbourne. And we did beat them in the final, I think it was in 2000. And... 2010. 2010, yeah, that's right. So it wasn't that long ago. And, you know, as you said, that round 21 matchup could be crucial in terms of top four spots. You know, if we get two, two games or end up top two, a long way away, I know, and – touch all the wood in the world but if we do get top two obviously um you know having two games at home is going to be crucial for us in terms of the end of season for that um set up as well and the way we go from there so but as said, we're an anywhere anytime team as ross Lyon says and uh, there should be no excuses if we do lose this week but you know as you said our best 22 have got to run out there and do the best they can so we'll see what happens so but thanks for joining us again gil it's great to have you on board and uh Obviously, we'll try and get you on board again throughout the rest of the season as well. I know it's a bit tough with the time differences over there, but it's been fantastic having you today. Thank you so much for having me on, and uh, I hope everyone again in Western Australia, thank you for putting up with a weird American accent on the podcast. And uh, I'm right there with you in spirit, and hopefully we'll get down there uh, before the end of the season. And if not then, then hopefully for uh, the grand final, when we're when we are in the grand final again. Yeah, for sure. So just before you go, Gil, what's your tip for this week? Um, are you, you're, gonna, you're not going to let me off the hook with that, are you? No, I'm not, mate. You've got to, uh, you've got to, <laughs> you've got to come off the fence. You, based on every, so let's assume what we know, who is it, who, who right. isn't playing. So you're not going to get All off right. that easy. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off the fence, and uh, I am going to say that uh, the Freo will win this one by seven points. All right, well, as I said, I'll certainly be happy with that. And... Uh, you know, it's one of those times that if you do tip the wrong team and uh, and you get the right result, then it's happy days all around. So you don't mind losing those ones. But thanks again for joining us. We'll uh, catch up with you next week. And uh, as I said, we should have uh, Sefo back from his uh, junket next week as well. And uh, hopefully enjoy the game, guys, and we'll uh, see you next week. Bye for now.